Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Today we will discuss a very important guideline of RCOG that is Green Top Guideline number 55 and the name of that guideline is Late Intrauterine Fetal Death and the Stillbirth. The first question which is asked in this guideline is what is the optimal method for diagnosing late intrauterine fetal demise? And the answer is first of all auscultation and cardiotocography. But the guideline says that the auscultation and cardiotocography should not be used to investigate suspected IUFT. We have to use the other modalities like real-time ultrasonography, which is essential for accurate diagnosis of IUFT. Ideally, real-time ultrasonography should be available at all the times. There is importance of a second opinion, which should be obtained whenever practically possible. Next point is about the passive fetal moments. Mother should be prepared for the possibility of passive fetal moments. If the mother reports passive fetal moments after the scan to diagnose IUFT, a repeat scan should be offered. Next question in this guideline is that, what is the best practice for discussing the diagnosis and subsequent care? The guideline states that if the woman is unaccompanied, an immediate offer should be made to call her partner, relatives or friends. Secondly, discussion should aim to support maternal and parental choices. Next, the patient should be offered written information to supplement discussions. Now, what are the general principles of investigations? First of all, the clinical assessment and laboratory test should be recommended to assess the maternal well-being, including the coagulopathy, and to determine the cause of death the chances of recurrence and possible means of avoiding further pregnancy complications. The second point is that the parents should be advised that no specific cause is found in almost half of the stillbirths. Third point is that the parents should be advised that when a cause is found, it can crucially influence care in the future pregnancy. Another point, in point is that carers should be aware that an abnormal test results is not necessarily related to IUFT. Correlation between blood test and postpartum examination should be sought. Further testing might be indicated following the results of the postpartum examination. Postmortem examination. And system that use the customized uh, weight charts and capture multiple contributing factors should be used to categorize the late IUFTs. Next question in this guideline is that, are there any special recommendations for the woman with an IUFT who are rhesus D negative? First of all, women who are RHD negative should be advised to have Glehar test undertaken urgently to detect the large fetal maternal hemorrhage that might have occurred a few days earlier. Next, anti-RHD gamma globulin should be administered as soon as possible after presentation. Next point is that if there has been a, a large fetal maternal hemorrhage, the dose of anti-DRHD gamma globulin should be adjusted uh, upward and the Clehar test should be repeated at 48 hours to ensure that fetal red cells have cleared. Next point is that if it is important to know the fetal um, or the baby blood group, if no blood sample can be obtained from the baby or cord, RHD typing should be undertaken using free cell DNA from the maternal blood taken shortly after the birth. Now, what test should be recommended to identify the cause of late IUFT? Tests should be directed to identify scientifically proven causes of late IUFT. Now, let us talk about the tests recommended in IUFT. First is that of maternal standard hematology and biochemistry including CRPs and bile salts. Next, the platelet count is done to check for the occult DIC and that is repeated twice weekly. Next test is maternal coagulation time and plasma fibrinogen. These are done for the diagnosis of DIC. Although these are not the cause, not the test for the cause of late IUFT, but for the maternal sepsis, placental abruption and preeclampsia, which increase the chance of DIC, these tests are done, especially important if woman desires regional anesthesia. Next test is that of the Clehar test, which is done to diagnose the lethal fetal maternal hemorrhage and to decide the level of requirement for anti-RHD gamma globulin. Fetal maternal hemorrhage is the cause of IUFT and Clehar should be recommended for all the women not simply 
those who are rhg negative ensure the laboratory aware a woman is rhd positive and tests should be undertaken before birth as the red cell might clear quickly from the maternal circulation in rhg negative women second clay heart test also determine whether sufficient R anti rhd negative has been given the other tests include blood culture midstream urine vaginal swabs and the cervical swabs and the reasons for doing these tests are suspected maternal bacterial infection including listeria monocytogenes and chlamydia species these tests are done in cases of maternal fever and flu like symptoms abnormal liquor and prolonged rupture of membrane before late iuft other tests include the viral screen syphilis and tropical infections and these tests are done for occult maternal fetal infections so basically the stored sedum from the booking test can provide baseline serology and parvovirus b19 rubella cmv herpes simplex and toxoplasmosis gondii can be detected by these tests hydrops not necessarily a feature of parvovirus related late iuft treponemal serology usually known already also these tests are done when the patient travel to endemic areas another important test is maternal random blood glucose and that is done to detect the occult maternal diabetes mellitus so rarely a woman uh, will have incidental type 1 diabetes mellitus usually with a severe ketoacidosis and women with a gestational diabetes mellitus return to the normal glucose tolerance within few hours after the late iuft has occurred next test is that of the maternal hba1c which is done in diabetes mellitus detection because most women with uh, gestational diabetes mellitus have normal hba1c and need to test for the gestational diabetes mellitus in the future pregnancy that might also indicate the occult type 1 and type 2 diabetes the maternal thyroid functions are done to detect the occult maternal thyroid diseases and those tests include tsh free t4 and free t3 levels next the maternal thrombophilia screen is done to detect the maternal thrombophilia that is indicated if evidence of the fetal growth restriction or placental disease is there or uh, to check the association between inherited thrombophilia and ifd uh, if that is weak and the management in the future pregnancy is uncertain most of the tests are not affected by the pregnancy and if no if abnormal repeat at the 6 weeks interval and also we need to do the anti phospholipid screen uh, that is done and that is repeated if abnormal usually um, after 4 weeks it is repeated next test is anti red cell antibody serology that is um, done to detect the immune hemolytic disease and it is indicated if fetal hydrops is evident clinically or on postpartum exam postmortem examination next test is maternal anti rho and anti lo antibody test that is used to detect the occult maternal autoimmune disease and it is indicated if there is evidence of hydrops and do myocardial fibroelastosis or av node calcifications at the post mortem next test is maternal autoimmune anti platelet antibody test that is used to detect the autoimmune thrombocytopenia and it is indicated if fetal intracranial hemorrhage is found on post mortem examination the other important test include the paternal or the parental blood for the karyotyping the reason for doing is parental to, to detect the parental balance translocation and parental mosaicism these tests are specially indicated if we suspect fetal unbalanced uh, translocation and if we find any fetal aneuploidies or if we suspect these aneuploidies like 45x like turner syndrome or if we suspect fetal genetic testing failure and uh, if the history is suggestive of the aneuploidy like fetal abnormality on post mortem or if there is previous unexplained iuft or if there is history of recurrent miscarriage next test is maternal urine for cocaine metabolites that is uh, done in case of the occult drug use these tests are done with the consent if history or presentation or suggestive of these drug abuse fetal and placental microbiology are done on the fetal blood fetal swabs and the placental swabs to detect the fetal infections and these give more information than maternal serology for detecting viral infections these are these tests are done on cord uh, or the cardiac blood if possible in lithium heparin written uh, consent is advisable for the cardiac blood and uh, need to be obtained using the clean technique Next test include the fetal and placental tissues for the karyotype and possible single gene testing like deep uh, fetal skin fetal cartilage and placenta 
and these tests are done for detecting the aneuploidy and single gene disorders. These tests are absolutely contraindicated if parents do not wish. Written consent is essential and since several specimen cell culture might fail. Culture model must be uh, kept in the labor ward and genetic material should be stored. Postmortem examination is done externally or in uh, autopsy or while doing the microscopy or while doing the X-ray examination and it is done on the placenta and cord and definitely the written consent is essential in such case as well. Now another question in this guideline is that what precautions should be taken when sexing the baby? First of all, the parents should be advised before the birth about the potential difficulty in sexing their baby when appropriate. Secondly, two experienced healthcare practitioners like midwives of obstetricians, neonatologists or pathologists should inspect the baby while examining the external genitalia of extremely preterm and severely macerated or grossly heterotopic infants. And if there is any difficulty or doubt, rapid carrier type should be offered using the quantitative fluorescence PCR or the fluorescence in situ hybridization. Now, what is the best practice guidance for the cytogenetic analysis of the baby? First of all, written consent should be taken for any fetal sample used for karyotyping. Secondly, samples from the multiple tissues should be used to increase the chance of the culture. Thirdly, more than one cytogenetic technique should be available to maximize the chance of informative results. Fourthly, the cultured fluid should be stored in refrigerator and thawed thoroughly before use. Next comes the labor and birth. What are the recommendations for timing and the mood of the birth? First of all, recommendations about the labor and birth should be taken into account the mother's preferences as well as her medical condition and previous intrapartum history. Secondly, women should be strongly advised to take immediately, immediate steps toward the delivery if there is sepsis, preeclampsia, placental abruption or membrane rupture, but a more flexible approach can be discussed if these factors are not present. Thirdly, while a woman with intact membranes and no laboratory evidence of DIC should be advised that they are unlikely to come to physical harm if they delay labor for a short period but they may develop severe medical complications and suffer greater anxiety with a prolonged interval. Women who delay labor for a period longer than 48 hours should be advised to have testing for DIC twice weekly. So I have discussed uh, very important points from uh, this RCOG guideline. The next important points are about the clinical governance which you can study from the full RCOG guideline. I would like to complete my presentation with this code. There is no shortcut for hard work that leads to effectiveness. You must stay disciplined because most of the work is behind the scenes. So thank you so much. Wish you all the best. Allah Hafiz.